In this video, we're going to review circular motion and gravitation for AP Physics 1. When an object is going in a circle, we can measure its period and frequency. Period is the time for one revolution, and it's measured in seconds. Frequency is the number of revolutions per second, and it's measured in hertz. To calculate the period of an object going in a circle, we can take the time it takes to go around a certain number of revolutions. So for example, if this ball takes 20 seconds to go around 10 revolutions, the period will be 2 seconds. The frequency is the number of revolutions divided by the time. So let's say it goes around 10 revolutions in 20 seconds. So we'll take 10 divided by 20 and we get 0.5 hertz. You'll notice that the period and frequency are inverse. So you can calculate frequency by taking the inverse of the period or calculating period by taking the inverse of the frequency. Now let's take a look at the directions of the vectors. So as this ball is going around in a circle, it has a velocity, and the velocity is in the direction that it's moving. In this case, it's going in this direction. So I'm going to label that V. And then it also has an acceleration. Remember that anytime you're speeding up, slowing down, or changing direction, you have an acceleration. In this case, we are changing direction. So we're going to assume this is uniform circular motion, which means that it's moving at constant speed in a circle. And the acceleration is going to be towards the center. And we'll label that AC. And the net force is also towards the center because the net force, the F net, is in the same direction, always in the same direction as the acceleration. Now this acceleration, we call this the centripetal acceleration because it's pointed towards the center of the circle. To calculate the magnitude of this velocity, we can use distance divided by time. The distance for a circle is 2 pi r, and the time for one circle is the period. We can also rewrite this to solve for the period by taking the circumference 2 pi r and divide it by v. Now we know that frequency is equal to 1 over the period. So if we plug this in, we can get this equation. The speed of the object going in a circle is equal to 2 pi r, and then plugging in the f, we get 2 pi r f. To calculate the centripetal acceleration, we can take the speed squared divided by r and combining this with Newton's second law f net equals m a we get that the net force is equal to m v squared over r. Now this net force for a uniform circular motion is going to point towards the center so we call this the centripetal net force because it's pointing towards the center and it is also a net force in case there's more than one force in forces involved. Now let's talk about centripetal force. So centripetal force is not another force. It is a role that any force can play. Let's take a look at some examples and ask ourselves what force is playing the role of centripetal force. So first we have a ball on a string that we're swinging over our head and this is a top-down view. So the force that is playing the role of centripetal force is going to be tension. And remember that the centripetal force is always towards the center of the circle. Next we have a car going in a circle and the force that's playing the centripetal force here is going to be force of friction, specifically the static friction, even though the wheels are moving. It's not moving side to side relative to the ground. Next, we have a planet going around the sun. And the centripetal force here is played by the force of gravitational force. And next, we have a, a barrel ride at an amusement park. This is swinging. And so the person is like feels like it's being pushed towards the wall here. And the uh, wall is playing, the wall pushing on the person is playing the role of centripetal force. And we'll call that the normal force. Next, we have a string that we're swinging a ball. And you may have done the flying pig lab in your class and where it's going around a circle. But the string is at an angle to the circle. And so the triple force here is played by not just the tension, even though there is a tension force, it's going to be played by a component of that tension. So here's here are the two components of that tension. And so it's going to be played by the horizontal, we'll call that Vx here, but the horizontal component of Ft. 
And then the last one here, we have the car on a banked turn here. We know that there is gravitational force here, of course. And then there's also a normal force. Okay. So what force is playing the role of centripetal force here is going to be a component of the normal force. So it's going to be this component, this uh, horizontal component. Once again, I'll just call this F x for now and that is the component that will contribute to the centripetal force here. So now we're going to take a look at a bucket that's filled with water that we're swinging vertically. And if we swing this fast enough, we can actually keep the water in the bucket. And the reason for that is because um, Newton's first law reminds us that an object in motion tends to want to stay in motion. So the water in this bucket tends to want to go in a straight line. Now, gravity is pulling down a little bit. That's true. But if we swing it fast enough, this bucket is going to catch it as it goes around. Uh, the first thing I want to think about is the direction of the velocity and the direction of the acceleration. So the direction of the velocity is going to be tangent of uh, the circle, which is going to be towards the left here. Uh, that's the direction of velocity. The direction of the acceleration is going to be towards the center because uh, it's going in a circular motion here. Uh, next thing I want to ask is what is the tension force of this bucket? Uh, so to figure that out, I'm going to first draw a force diagram of this bucket and we have gravitational force Fg and we also have tension and this tension force will depend on uh, how fast we're swinging it. So using our centripetal net force equation we have Fc equals mv squared over r. The Fc is a net force so I like to include that symbol right there just remember remind me that this this is a net force and since they're in the same direction I'm going to add them so fg plus ft is equal to mv squared over r now to find ft we would just take mv squared over r minus fg Okay. So that would be for at the top. And um, another question we can ask is, what is the minimum uh, speed we need to get this bucket to go in a circle? Because if you go too slow, the water will fall out. So there is, you need to have a minimum amount of speed. So that would be when we set FT to zero. So if we set FT, if we set that to zero, then we end up with Fg, which is equal to Mg, is equal to Mv squared over R. And notice that the Ms cancel out, and then we're left with V squared equals Gr. So the minimum, so the minimum speed that you need to get this going to scroll with the water without the water coming out is going to be square root G times R, and R is the radius of the circle. Now, what if we were looking at the bucket at the bottom of the swing? So right there. Uh, so once again, we're going to draw our force diagram. And we're going to have Fg in the down direction. And Ft is going to be in the up direction because it's going in a circle. And the centripetal net force needs to be towards the center of the circle. So that means that the Ft needs to be greater than Fg. Uh, once again, using our centripetal net force equation equals mv squared over r. We're going to take ft minus fg. And the reason we're subtracting them is because they're in opposite direction, equal to mv squared over r. And to solve for ft, uh, we would just add mv squared over r plus fg. Now we'll take a look at Newton's law of gravitation which tells us that there is a gravitational force between any two mass. So here we have two masses, one and M2, and there's a gravitational force between these two mass, and we'll label this Fg and Fg. Notice that both Fg are equal but in opposite direction, so this reminds us of Newton's third law about action-reaction forces, that they are equal in an opposite direction. So previously we've learned that gravitational force is, we can calculate that equal uh, to mass times g, the gravitational field strength. And uh, to calculate the gravitational uh, field, kind of by definition, you can take the weight of an object and divide it by its 
mass. Uh, however, to use this equation, you need to know what the gravitational field is at that location, and sometimes we don't know what that is. So uh, is there another way to calculate the gravitational force? And the answer is yes. And to do that, uh, we use this equation, uh, Newton's law of gravitation, which tells us that the gravitational force between two objects is the gravitational constant big G times m1 times m2 divided by their distance squared. So the r is going to be the distance from the center to the center of the objects and that is going to be r. And notice that there it's always going to be attractive. So when you have two masses they're always going to attract each other. Big G is the gravitational constant and this is a number that is constant throughout the universe as far as we know. Uh, the units are newtons meters squared per kilogram. It's helpful to remember that the gravitational force is proportional to the product of the masses. So if one of the masses doubled, the gravitational force is doubled. If they're both doubled, then 2 times 2 is 4, then the gravitational force is 4 times. The other thing that's helpful to remember is that the gravitational force is proportional to the 1 over the distance squared. So this is called an inverse this inverse square relationship. So if I were to double the distance, the gravitational force would go down, not by two, but by four because of the square. If I triple the distance, the gravitational force would go down by one ninth. So not one third because there's that square, so it'd be one ninth. On the other hand, if I brought the two masses closer to each other so that they're half the distance, the gravitational force would increase, not by two, but two squared, which is going to be four. So uh, keep these two in mind. To help us visualize gravitational fields, we can use what are called gravitational field lines and these are these lines that uh, point in the direction of the gravitational field and where it is closer you have a larger gravitational field and where you are farther where the lines are spread apart you have a smaller uh, gravitational field so the closeness or how far they are apart tells you the gravitational field strength now is there a way to calculate the gravitational field on the surface of the earth obviously there is because you know that number is 9.8 but how do we get that number? Uh, we can combine these two equations, this one and this one together. Uh, we get mg equals big G. And instead of m1 and m2, I'm going to make big M or the mass of the planet and little m, just a little test mass, just a little mass. And the mg here, that m is also that uh, little mass, that little test mass that we're using, uh, divided by r squared. Uh, which is going to just be the radius of the Earth. You'll notice that the mass of the test mass cancels out, so really it doesn't really matter that mass there. Uh, we just don't want it too big. We don't want it to affect the gravitational field too much. And so the gravitational field strength on the surface of the Earth is big G, the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth squared. And uh, we plug those things in, uh, we're going to get 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Um, uh, it turns out that the gravitational field strength is equal to the acceleration due, due to gravity. Uh, so uh, because it's 9.8 newtons per kilogram, the acceleration due to gravity on Earth is uh, 9.8 meters per second squared. On the bottom left here, I have a graph to kind of help you visualize how the gravitational field changes as you're going further away from the surface of the planet, in this case, Earth. So as you go away, notice this inverse relationship decreases and you're moving away. Uh, let's bring this all together using our Newton's law of gravitation and centripetal force equation and ask the question, how long would it take for a moon to orbit a planet. So uh, we're going to combine the two equations, Newton's law of gravitation, big G, mass of the planet times the mass of the moon divided by the distance of the moon to the planet and we're measuring from the center to center and we're setting that equal to our centripetal force equation which is m v squared over r. Now be careful that this m is the m that's moving in a circle not the m of the planet. Uh, notice that the m's cancel out that leaves us with v squared equals gravitational constant times the mass of the planet divided by the distance from the moon to the planet measuring from the center to the center. We also know that the 
speed of an object moving in a circle is the circumference 2 pi r divided by the period. So combining these two, we get 2 pi r over the period squared is equal to big G big M divided by r. And then we're going to square the left hand side, then solve for t squared. When we square root both sides, we get the equation for the period of the moon. If we substitute the Earth's moon for r and the Earth's moon's mass for big M, then we get approximately 27 days. You can use this equation for the orbit of anything that's going around a large mass, such as a satellite going around the Earth.